Hey folks, with us today, Ivan, founder of Monite. Super happy to have you on. Hi, Nicholas. Great, great being here. Very excited for our chat. Let's start with the most important thing. What is Monite and who is it for? Yeah, Monite is basically an embedded uh, finance player. Um, so what we help uh, people do is, is very simple. So we go to B2B platforms such as vertical SaaS providers or B2B neobanks or payment providers, and we help them become super apps finance, super apps for their users, essentially by plugging in essential workflows that businesses need every day. Um, revenue management, spending management, we plug in the software right inside their interface, and they basically become like build.com like invoice to go but for their existing customer base and the integration takes them like literally four to five weeks versus a couple of years um, in-house building time and i think the innovation we're making here is that everyone in embedded finance is all about like payments or cars or something else and we're saying look it's actually more about workflows if you own the workflow then you earn the right to make a payment and you can monetize users and that's pretty much what we help platforms do so it's basically a white label solution for them that they can fully integrate and the end user will never know that you're in the back end, right? Correct. Yeah. Well, white label is, uh, is a tricky word here in a sense that sometimes yeah, people yeah. mean it's like pre-built, but we're actually API building blocks. So, you know, they, they can make it look like whatever they want. And that's the beauty of it. So it's not one size fits all. It's actually an API that you can customize to different audiences. Um, so it's more like you just don't have to build stuff. You just customize the UX and then it works out of the box. That makes a ton of sense. But if I would guess, it feels like this is quite enterprise heavy, right? Because you have maybe a small amount of customers that are potentially big. So tell us a bit about the, the go-to-market of that. Yeah, I mean, we, we typically do direct go-to-market, aka direct sales. Um, but luckily, we've been getting a lot of inbound too through, you know, investor introductions or just the websites. Um, and I think the, the platforms of work with are actually very different. They range from smaller startups that are trying to release an all-in-one proposition. In fact, one of our earliest customer, NT, um, they're actually a, a fairly small company in Estonia. And, you know, they've been getting great traction with SMB customers, just embedding Monite's functionalities early um, and this ranges up um, to you know bigger bigger customers bigger payment providers and you know banks that we're talking to um, and those guys are basically um, obviously hundreds of thousands of SMB customers I think the biggest difference is like how long is the sales cycle and how complex is their internal structure to plug anything in so for startups we see them signing in you know a few weeks and then plugging it in in another few weeks. With anyone bigger, it takes months and it takes months to plug in, not because of technical complexity, but because internal um, alignment on, for those guys takes longer. Um, so that's pretty much the customer audience. But you're right that especially mid and long term, uh, we're looking at more enterprise heavy um, customer funnel. Um, and, you know, our head of um, API, now CTO, Alex, actually comes from Adyen. And we've been having this debate, like, are we Adyen or are we Stripe? And I think we are more of Adyen in this sense, but we're also planning to be a little bit more like Stripe down the line to enable the longer uh, tail of the market to just plug this in and play it their way. Meaning right now you're like basically like, you need to hand to, to handle the customer to to get it up and running, but in the future, PLG might become an option, so that like even a tiny startup from I don't know Berlin, Barcelona, or whatever can can start using you guys. Yeah, correct. I mean, now now we could probably take a tiny startup. I mean, the price tag is not going to be tiny. Uh, we're generally not super cheap. Uh, we're more like a Mercedes of, of our industry. So we, we charge the adequate price tag. But I think the bottom line is that we, we do support each customer with go live. We you know run a Slack channel with them. We're pretty close to them every step of the way, provide a lot of guidance. I think over time, when the industry matures and our niche is, I would say, very new, uh, when there is more industry experience, people will just have um, kind of less needs for our help and they'll be more self-sufficient. And in, in that situation, it would make sense to maybe open up the door and have a little bit more of a self-service option. Today, what we saw whether we tried self-service early on, it was like, you know, people just like don't really understand this. And when they buy from us, they don't buy functionality only. They buy expertise. They buy basically market knowledge. They buy UX, UI expertise. And there are a lot of these pieces that are very hard to deliver in self-service. Um, and that's exactly why we sort of like went a little bit more 
um, kind of customized approach per customer. This is also why the price tag is a little bit higher. But in the end, this is actually the ROI driver for our platforms. I would love to put a pin in that because what I heard you say is basically they come to you for the job to be done and also like the benefit and not for like this specific feature they saw on the website and they can test out and you have like a very strong background in marketing over 10 years ex head of growth at Penta Business Accounts chief growth officer at Bunch AI so how do you approach this sales driven approach with the marketing background I mean like How, how do you play the whole thing? Like, what's something that you do due to the strong marketing background yeah. that you think a founder that might be like engineering, have an engineering background, might, might just like not, not yeah. see those opportunities? Yeah, look, I think uh, more, more than anything, Monite's and Monite's strategy are largely a result of me being a marketer and thinking like a marketer. Because um, if you think about Monite's strategic approach, right, like we don't go like if, if we kind of take a couple steps back, the industry we're working in generally is more like accounts payable, accounts receivable automation or let's say finance automation. Um, absolute majority of players, if not all, um, actually play a B2B game, which means that they produce build.com like software for SMB customers and sell it to SMB customers. We were the first company to actually go and say, look, guys, this doesn't really make sense. The future looks different. And this should be an API. This should be infrastructure pluggable into other platforms. And this was by itself, I would even call this whole strategy a gross concept. And it's indirect go to market via platforms. It was mainly driven by the fact that when we talked to customers, when, and Monite started as one of those B2B players, right? So when we talked to customers in the early days, we understood that they see the world a little bit differently. And my marketing hat was like, what is the perfect proposition for these people? And the perfect proposition for these people was like, hey, go get another software. No, no, not that. It's more like, hey, you guys want more functionality and more animation, and you would much tr rather trust the software, the provider you're already using, such as Neobank or a payment provider or verticalized SaaS, and you just want more functionality in there. Now, these guys just can't deliver special finance workflows. They, they don't specialize in this. They don't have expertise. It's not really their game. So what if we could deliver you the whole super app in one place? And then the response was very positive, right? So that is the first stone, our whole strategy and our all overall go-to-market as infrastructure provider. And I think then the, the second tier is now that we're doing this, how to explain it to platforms so they understand what it's about. And I would say, you know, it took us quite some time to uh, calibrate messaging. Now we're more a messaging around people becoming super apps, people making um, a lot more money per customer and driving more engagement. And then we customize this message just a little bit more um, towards specific segments. For example, for verticalized SaaS, we would always say, guys, you want to become an operating system for your type of company. Like if you're a construction company software, You want to be everything you can for a construction company. And then your check size is super high. Your retention is super high. And it's a lot easier for you to, you know, get new customers, uh, raise money, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, this is basically how we gravitate. And then the outbound is more of a tool of how to get the message out to the audience. And there, my role is just basically um, creating the right messaging map, the right positioning that our sales team and I, of course, um, can use together to outreach to specific personas, such as like CPO or CEO, with a little different message and um, see if they actually want to and get something like Monite in. So that's that's basically my head as a marketer. I, and I'm obviously leaving um, uh, leaving um, the obvious part out, which is basically just like standard website work or like Google ads or organic, et cetera, which drives inbound in. That's, that's more or less given. But this messaging and this overall strategy is, I would say, largely my marketing head on. If you need to hire the right developers and ship fast, then React Squad is for you a boutique agency that specializes in React and only works with fast-growth startups. Visit reactsquad.io to learn more. So operationally, you ha do you have like one specific subsection of the landing page or like uh, of the website, or like one landing page per vertical and then really say, hey, sales guy number one, target this vertical, sales guy number two, target this vertical. And then we, of course, like have the messaging for each and then maybe even run like, pay-per-click ads for each like how do you execute on like the high level insights like tactically 
Yeah, look, I mean, I, I, I think uh, as you can see on our website, we do have um, vertical specific landing pages, but also um, our homepage and our other pages um, are designed around specific personas, although they are, I would say, generic enough to still accommodate others, right? And then, uh, for instance, we, we have general, like any infrastructure provider, two main groups of personas. Uh, one group is product slash business. And for those guys, we have the websites. And then we have a second uh, type of persona, which is anyone in from CTO to actual developers who'll be working on a product. And for those guys, we have, um, I would say, like a completely different section of the website called developers, where it's like a different experience and um, a lot of other assets that they care about. It looks different. It's black theme versus white theme. Um, and it's a lot of cool work that goes into creating all of that si- uh, side. Um, and that's that's basically how we cater to uh, different personas. And then when it comes to audiences, uh, we have customized landing pages for different ads that we run um, and then specific campaigns, right? So we would run like a LinkedIn ads campaign um, or again to towards a specific type of vertical SaaS and they would land on a specific landing page or they would, for example, be able to download accounts payable or accounts receivable guide for vertical um, SaaS companies and stuff, something like this. The whole point of this is just kind of doing enough education, enough nurturing in the funnel before we actually speak to them. So we're actually speaking the same language and we validate that they have the needs. So is it a bit like account-based marketing, meaning you know quite well which company you targeted from the marketing side before anyone from the sales team even reached out to them? I mean, uh, th- that's 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 more like the short, medium-term plan to start doing that more. I think it's just all about capacity. Um, in general, what we do is we address specific audiences and we see who reacts. It's a little bit more sort of like customer-driven, like whoever reacts gets to speak to sales team or sales team has a target hit list of accounts that they actually go after. We're planning to start supporting them a little bit more with ABM. We have to see how the ROI of this um, is going to be right now. Um, ABM is also content heavy, so it's all kind of like ties together. You need to have assets for all of this and people to execute. Um, I think we're still maybe a little too early. However, that's that's exactly the plan. And I would say the main value I see as a marketer in, in doing all these activities is that it just it just creates enough education, enough context for someone to want to speak to us. In the end of the day, like we, we don't want to speak to people if they actually don't have the need, right? Um, and in fact, I think our um, our marketing efforts have been very successful in um, making the funnel a lot more relevant. Like when we started, it was like all sorts of people. Now we get requests that are just like crazy targeted, like, hey, I'm this type of platform in like, I don't know, UAE. I'm serving this type of customer. They're asking me for this functionality. I want to embed specifically this and this and this model. This is my timeline. I want to speak to somebody to see exactly this. And here are three questions that I want to answer. Like, can't ask for a better lead. Very specific conversation. (laughs) Or there are others who come and say, look, we're exploring this topic. We had no idea this can be embedded. Looks super promising because it's super hard to build. Let's speak. Great. Another, another good one, right? So I think that's, that's where we want to get to meet term where people come to us with a more or less formulated request uh, because those deals just go a lot smoother. Makes a ton of sense. And then let's switch gears a bit and talk about the team and like the company building side of things. You raised 17.4 million in total, 16.4 in a recent seat, uh, in, a, in a seat round of that. How big is the team right now and what's the structure like? Yeah, so 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 we're at 60 people. Um, most of that is uh, logical engineering. Um, we're very tech heavy. Uh, the type of stuff we build, sometimes customers tell us like, oh, it's easy. Or like, look guys, we can give you all the specs, go build it yourself and like you will want to die. So like it, it, it's, it's a lot of work that goes into this. Um, in fact, a PER companies that are B2B companies, they employ hundreds, if not thousands of engineers. So what our team being whatever, 20, 30 tech people was able to accomplish is very impressive. Um, especially given that it's API first and fully, um, fully out in the market. Um, so generally half of the company is tech. Um, and then we have, uh, more and more obviously, uh, also like operational and, uh, cross 
um, cross a company setup, like it functions like marketing or like operations or something else um, that just pal with uh, with headcount growth and also operating in multiple regions. Um, and today we're live in Europe, in the US, um, and also in some um, in a couple of different markets, like for example Middle East or a couple countries in Africa. And largely for us, like we're we're not kind of running after international expansion, but it comes naturally sometimes when an existing customer or a new customer asks for new region like we recently got an australian platform and we found an easy way to support australia to a certain extent um, and so that's that's basically how we operate with this comes uh, more more exposure to international challenges and like better platform overall but also comes an operational challenge of supporting all these markets operations wise payments wise and tax compliance wise and that's why we also have a tax compliance function in-house and then on the on the sales and marketing side well, like how many people work in those functions and like what's like the the what are the titles uh, of those people yeah we we have actually three people in sales now which is a small team for the targets that uh, they they got right and we were very ambitious um and uh, one person in the marketing side full time um so basically on the sales team we have had a sales general had a sales us um, and a more junior, um, let's say, SDR person who is actually helping us fill the funnel. We are now hiring a couple more um, salespeople in the US, um, hopefully um, already hired soon. Um, and then in marketing, our approach is a little bit more sort of having um, a full-time senior person um, in a lead and then um, stuffing them with the right uh, freelance help on specific topics, be that performance marketing, website management, um, or anything else. And then we also deploy, obviously, things like an PR agent, Agency or social media agencies, um, the guys who are hyper specialized and help us cover a specific area. And do you work with contractors there just because they are like way faster to to get up to speed of what you're thinking on? Hey, let's hire that externally instead of internally. Look, I'm I'm uh, I'm personally all in for building good in house teams. Uh, good in house teams uh, cost money. And, uh, you know, depending on the stage, we just have to make some choices. And for now, you know, like a major investment goes into sales and engineering. Uh, whereas for marketing, like car currently we can get away with, uh, with some freelance help. And, but these are not like, you know, ad hoc freelancers. These are more like people who work with us on a firm basis, just not full time. Um, and this is just not, you, you don't always need a person to like full-time website developer. Like we don't have a website this size that we would need a full-time person. Um, and the same goes for like, you know, design help or agency help for performance ads, etc. And then I think uh, in Benta also, you know, as, as you were referring to this, like I, I was actually a single, single um, head of growth up until we were a very decent size in terms of customer base. Um, and I was br uh, bridging in basically with freelancers or agencies. Um, and then when we had to make permanent hires, those were expensive. Um, like good, strong people that are actual specialists and then can replace an agency will cost proper money. Um, and there is also an additional overhead of managing this. So the moment you want to staff a full full time marketing team, you will probably need somebody like a CMO to also over oversee the team. Whereas if you have a wide head of marketing managing um, a few people here and there, it's it's a lot more manageable operations wise. So our approach at Monite is generally just like not blowing up headcounts, keeping it very reasonable, and focusing on hiring seniors who can multitask and really bring us to like a proper Series A. And after Series A, we can be a lot more flexible in terms of resources we deploy. The only exception kind of I would say is tech. Tech is all full time uh, because otherwise, like this is this is absolute core product, um, and hiring freelancers that are outsourcing um, isn't really the practice that we consider optimal. Um, and that's why everything that we built is is built in house, um, unless there is obviously a partner in the background helping us with it. I think that that makes a ton of sense. And I mean, my day job is literally helping like a company matching startups with developers. And I always tell them, hey, have a CTO, have at least one or two senior guys in there. And then by all means, use someone like us or TopTal or whatever to staff that and like get the velocity up. But it's crazy to me if people fun, like start software companies and don't have tech in-house. Like, And that's like, even even though that's my business, I... I can't like I can't understand it. So, 
yeah, different look, I kind think of it, words. It's also <laughs> yeah, it's also the 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 risk uh, the risk tolerance of a founder. Like I personally think um, it's a lot safer to have full time tech people who are fully responsible for what they do, and also like for for us, it's uh, it's becoming a requirement as well due to the fact that we're getting ISO and SOC certified. And there are completely different rules of the game apply, especially as we move up uh, market and start working with enterprise customers. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's so important. Like even like, I mean, for, for the regular sets, it's just like, I don't know, like they get like a cheap freelancer and they build shitty tech, which then doesn't scale. But like for you, like security is like a big thing. So I totally get it. But like the point I want to get to is, I mean, you you mentioned that you target the, the Series A next and you're, in that in the like doing the company for four years now and from 2020 to now 2024 the environment shifted a lot on the funding side so how do a how do you see the funding environment right now or the fundraising environment and b what how do you see the shift from your perspective and like how do you manage that shift yeah look i, I think uh, i think this uh this is spot on the environment has changed uh 2021 was like crazy high and then it sort of like went down drastically um i guess the like the position we ended up with was very lucky because we were never overvalued we always stayed within reasonable market multiples um in terms of valuation um and i'm just not a big deliver in like blowing up your valuation to 100 million with like whatever a million in revenue and then i'm um, sort of like having a hard lending once the market changes right um and like many founders i i learned and this is this is definitely a learning to be more philosophical about dilution and just know that you know if if it makes uh, if it makes sense then investors will top me up um, later down the line when the company does well it's in their interest but if i watch dilution too much and i try to like you know increase my valuation I might actually put myself and company in jeopardy, uh, which is why our approach has always been staying reasonable, staying within market boundaries. Um, and we continued um, kind of adjusting as as the markets changed, right? So this is why, for example, we stretched our uh, stretched out our seed. We did seed in multiple portions um, and we all purposefully didn't do the A because we, we believe the market is going to recover a little bit more this year and it's going to be more favorable to fundraise. Um, and then in general, I think that uh, the paradigm shifted from like, hey, let's build cool, innovative uh, companies all over, and you know, like uh, prove that it makes some sense. But like the the, the proof can come later. Uh, now it's a little bit more like, look, guys, we want to fund businesses. It needs to make money. There needs to be some sort of like line of sights to. If not profitability, then just positive unit economics um, and dynamics around like potential exits uh, become a lot more important, especially as IPO market is um, is kind of like um, in a weird state. And so, w- with all of that combined, I think um, I I at least spent a lot of time re-enabling myself as a founder to um, kind of to just understand like what are the new metrics to watch. Um, I spent quite a lot of time doing roadshows, talking to investors, not to fundraise, but like literally to ask everyone, like, guys, look, what's the new Series A benchmark? And the, the major finding for me is that the benchmarks have shifted drastically. So the major the major challenge this creates for all of us is that like we raised money in X environment. Like the the moment I raised my first seat, I'm already beyond Series A targets that I agreed with investors. But with new market conditions, I'm below. So then if I want a proper Series A, then I need to work further to, to reach these conditions. And so our job as founders is staying as sober as possible around the new benchmark and making sure that we navigate our fundraising and company strategy to actually be able to hit the new benchmarks. Um, and, I, and I still see some people are married to like 2021 and saying like, hey, what the hell? Like I can't raise Series A with a million ARR. It's difficult. It's difficult because the, the multiples are down. Um, n- not to say there are no exceptions. There are exceptions, but the question is also like when I see somebody raising at a billion dollars now, I- I'm not sure if I'm happy for them or if I should be sorry for them. They can do nice secondaries as founders and earn some money. But what happens in their Series B or what happens in their Series C, which are increasingly difficult? And I think the other learning from there is basically just just thinking a couple steps down the line. Like what's going to happen in the next round? How much money do you need to raise if the environment doesn't improve or becomes a little bit worse, which is what we should plan for? then what do you guys need to achieve to actually make a B? Today, there are so many companies that just never make it. Um, and that's that's another that's another thing. Um, and then last but not least, the hardest thing for all of us in the startup world is to shift 
um, is to shift the thinking from like, hey, we're doing something cool to like, hey, we need to build a business. I have uh, friends who do like e-commerce businesses or just like, you know, self-started entrepreneurs doing smaller businesses, not venture backed. And those guys are all about revenue because for them, it's very simple. Whatever you earn is whatever you have. Whatever you earn enables you to spend more money on Google. It's not like, hey, I just raised like a couple of million from investors. So now I can like spend money on stuff I can't actually afford. And I think we need to get more of this mentality from real business. Like we raise venture money because we're building something complex that will scale but we need to make a business out of this. If we keep running a charity, it will just not end up in the right place. And enabling the team to see it is not easy because most of the people who work in startups and worked in startups are actually thinking, hey, it's, it's almost like 2021. It's going to be fine. No worries. But it's not no worries. It's actually really challenging. And so making this shift um, has been has been one of my priorities internally. That makes a ton of sense. And then where, where do you see the benchmark for a Series A for a SaaS company in 2024? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to quote one of my favorite investors, Jeremy Drunker from Infinity Lake. Jeremy is usually above the average on the market, but, you know, like the, 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 the latest I heard was like three or four million in revenue. Um, and so I think three or four million ARR is a solid Series A. Um, and then from there, it's basically, you can probably go down, um, but if you go down, you better have um, a really compelling story. Um, in the end of the day, there are different philosophies about this. Like the story comes first, probably, and it needs to make sense. It's better to have 2 million quality revenue than 4 million crap revenue. It's better to have 2 million great retention, amazing um, you know, track record, good cohorts data, more data overall than 4 million of like very fresh data. Um, so I think all, all of that depends, but more or less, um, I would say it's, it's definitely above 2 million. And then depending on sort of like the valuation appetite, it's two to four. And we're coming up on time. So as a final question, what are three pieces of marketing advice you would give to a founder who has an engineering background? Yeah, that's uh, that's a great question. I think the the main the main question I would start with is what does the user actually need, um, and this means that like, do they need it at all? And if so, what do they actually need? Um, a lot of us have an idea of what's needed, um, and there is a lot of confirmation bias we apply even when we do customer research. Um, so if you look at all those kind of dead zones in the startup market, they usually come from the needs not being around or needs not being urgent or not uh, need not being um, kind of uh, kind of important enough to um, to solve, right? And so that's that's the one thing. So just really be brutally honest about whether there is need uh, from your customer and what it is. Uh, the second piece of advice is uh, just just kind of make sure that the way you position the product is. Uh, done in customer's language and is consistent with the customer's worldview. AKA, if you think something is better for them, but they think that something else um, is, it makes more sense. Um, in terms of whatever, uh, your dashboard design, your like layout, the way you structure the workflow, the way you um, describe something on a website, I think it's it all starts from the customer and there is definitely some, some ego and some vision we should apply there, but it should be customer centric. And then the third one is I would advise to be very, uh, very strategic about how to acquire customers. And this starts by understanding their journey. Um, the journey means that you kind of look not at where they experience pain, but also a couple steps before. What happens to these people before they even realize there is need? Can you actually catch them and educate them earlier than obvious? And then by the time it becomes obvious, what's the best way to catch them where um, and how can you leverage, um, I would say, more performance-driven channels to do that? For example, at Panto, we used a lot of affiliate marketing and was super effective, right? Uh, because you only pay for actual conversions and for actual customers versus for clicks on Google. And so basically thinking through the value chain of like offering something of value, communicating it and designing it around the customer, and then catching the customer in the right place and time or even before then, would be the three things that I would tie together for a tech founder. Love it. Ivan, thanks a ton for coming on today and thanks for that marketing advice. Thanks, Nicholas, for having me. If you like this episode, then you'll love the SaaS Operator, a weekly newsletter brought to you by Early Node with actionable insights from SaaS experts in the industry delivered right to your inbox every Tuesday for free. Visit earlynode.com to subscribe.